All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jeff Klein, and I serve as the Deputy General Counsel representing the Public Utility Division. On behalf of the Corporation Commission, I want to welcome and thank everyone for being here today for a public meeting to discuss the, pro pro the proposed amendments to Chapter 5 and Chapter 10 rules. Uh, following today's meeting, there will be another public meeting on Tuesday, October 22nd at 1.30 p.m. All of these discussions will then be part of upcoming rulemakings later this fall and winter. I want to thank Commissioner Murphy for being here in person for today's meeting and also for all the staff for being here uh, and helping to contribute to these proposed rules being presented today. Uh, before we get into the heart of the presentation, as kind of a, a housekeeping matter, for those joining us via Scopia for our live stream, uh, if you'd like to be included on our sign-in sheets, please email me your contact information at jeff.klein, that's J-E-F-F dot K-L-I-N-E, at O-C-C dot O-K dot gov. And for those who are joining here in 301, please be sure to sign in on both the podiums. Um, during today's meeting, we're going to be going through each proposed change. If you would like to make a comment about a proposed change, please go to one of the lecterns and speak clearly into the microphone. There's a little button that you have to push on the microphone to get it to turn on. Uh, so that way everyone can hear you. If you believe that a provision should be changed that was not included in today's proposal, please be sure to bring that up after we go through the current items. If you have any specific wordsmithing language, please email those suggestions too, so that way we have the specific language you're wanting. If you're joining us via the live stream, thank you for testing our new system. Uh, it's not perfect. We're working on it. Uh, Unfortunately, we don't have the ability today for you to submit comments by audio, uh, but if you do have questions or comments, please be sure to email me and we will announce it and discuss it during the meeting today. And as a reminder, this is being live streamed, it is being recorded online, so it, you can review it later on uh, on the Scopia website. Uh, as for today's agenda, we'll go through Chapter 5 first and finish with Chapter 10. And so we'll go ahead and begin with the Transportation Division's proposed changes. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Michael Copeland. I'm the Deputy General Counsel for the Transportation Division. Appearing with me today is uh, direct, uh, Deputy Director Mark Willingham. On behalf of the uh, Transportation Division, we'd like to thank you all for being here. We have one proposed rule for this session. It, it occurs at uh, 25-2. And this rule relates to the confidentiality, uh, confidentiality of IFTA and IRP protest filings. And what it would essentially do is require the filer either to waive their confidentiality <clears throat> or put a motion of protective order to guard their, protect, their uh, confidentiality. And uh, so we'd be happy to take any questions. So just in general, what's the genesis for the inclusion of the proposal? So um, Title 47 in, under Oklahoma law requires us to keep this information uh, confidential, and we keep it confidential at all other levels. But when somebody files a protest, it suddenly gets put on our website for the whole world to see. So this, is, this will allow them to either say they do want the world to see it or they do not want the world to see it. So it's a statutory requirement. Okay, so if I'm a, I'm involved in this and I want to keep my information confidential, then I have to file uh, for a hearing to get a motion. Is that what? Is that how it works? File a motion for protective order. Yes, mm -hmm. ma'am. Yes, commissioner. And if I don't care, then I have to file a written waiver. Yes. So what if I don't get a protective order and what if I don't submit a written waiver? What happens then? It will automatically be dismissed, without prejudice. What will be dismissed? The protest. Okay. Okay. Okay, any suggested changes to that? All right, we'll begin there on page one, telephonic communication service. We're pleased to announce we have video conferencing equipment now in all of our courtrooms, including this one, the seven courtrooms downstairs here in Oklahoma City, and the two courtrooms in Tulsa. So we're adding specifically that we will have a tele, um, video conference communication system for all hearings 
we've actually already accomplished, accomplished that. With regard to 519 on page 2, um, in conjunction with that video conferencing equipment and telecommunications equipment, I'd like to sort of make a few changes to our proposed rules. Instead of having a distinction between protested hearings and unprotested hearings, I'd like to provide that any hearing may be participated in by telephone or video conference connection. We do want to require that the person participating make sure they have a secure and strong connection. And we'll be adding some language to suggest that um, if they're unable to obtain that secure and strong connection, that would not be grounds for continuance. But if there is not a good connection and the ALJ is unable to hear their testimony, then the ALJ would have the discretion to disregard the testimony or evidence presented by telecommunications or video conferencing. There at the top of page three, um, we want to strike the language that says, the newly proposed language that says a person appearing would be advised that it's being um, recorded. And of course, that's because every hearing is being recorded by a, either a tape recorder or a video conference or by a court reporter. And that's the case as well. Yeah. And let me just remind you if you're on your phone or on the um, phone, please be sure you mute. Don't put us on hold. We don't want your elevator music. But please mute your microphone so we don't hear anything going on in your office. Thank you. And then we will, of course, require a witness to file a affidavit that they <coughs> were the person testifying. And there is a um, draft or there is a witness affidavit in the back. It's one of the attachments or exhibits. And then also anybody participating by telephone or video conference needs to let the parties of record know that they need to participate by telephone or by video conference. Any questions or comments to those proposed changes? I, I have some questions. Or, yes, ma'am. Um, okay, on the Part C, um, I understand what the thought is. I think I would probably suggest um, some different thoughts as far as language. I don't specifically have it, but if it would be more, this seems incredibly prescriptive to me, um, but it seems like if it was something about like what if the testimony is inaudible or unclear or I don't know what that language should be, the ALJ or commission may decline to accept testimony or arguments in the absence of another medium or something like that. I, so I understand what you're trying to accomplish, but it seems like it maybe could be stated a little bit different way because as I read this, if it says if the video conference connection is unstable or weak, it's like the commission may disregard the testimony and you talked about continuances, but I, I think we need to be I think we need to be thoughtful about that language. And then my other comment goes to the affidavit. The affidavit doesn't just say that you are who you are. The affidavit says that I give my testimony that's unassisted. Because if somebody's by video conference, I mean, you don't know if somebody else is providing them information. And even when we've gone telephonic testimony, as I recall, that's included in the affidavit. It's not just about identifying who you are. It says, I think, in there that your testimony was unassisted. That's what the affidavit says. The rule might not say that, but I think that's what the affidavit says. The affidavit does say it's unassisted. Okay. So we just need to be thoughtful. If we're trying to give all the details for what's in the affidavit, we're missing something. But if we're not going to give all the details for the affidavit, then the affidavit speaks for itself, and you wouldn't need the details. So I think you got to choose one direction. I think, I think it's either got to be the affidavit and then the form kind of speaks for itself, or if you're going to lay out what's in the affidavit, then whatever's in it, that needs to be in here too. So I, I don't know what direction you want to go, but that would be my suggestion of kind of figuring out how, how you think that um, ought to go. And I, I, I'm sure that I might have some other comments, but those that just kind of hit me off the bat. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
Hi, Grayson Barnes here. I'm speaking on behalf of Calix uh, Energy Exploration and Production Company here in Tulsa. I'm also on this rule speaking on my own behalf as an officer of the court. Um, I find it to be terribly troublesome that a protest would be conducted such that I could not actually be in front of the witness that I'm cross-examining. Um, I think it was stated before we started our hearing today that there were some things that couldn't be done with the technology as is in this room, uh, much less the myriad of courtrooms we have here. If an exhibit gets modified by a witness, how does the witness telephonically look at that? Or how do they video conference look at that? Someone writes on the whiteboard, on the blackboard, uh, things along those lines I think are very troublesome, particularly uh, an affidavit. I understand um, the intent behind it such that a party would not be using Google or other maps or someone else in their office while testifying. Uh, but I have a feeling that if a $100 million project and a witness's job relies on their testimony, uh, maybe winning the case, not necessarily being accurate, I think that there's a lot of incentive for, for impropriety if we were to do it this way. Um, I've conducted several cases on the video conference equipment uncontested, and they take substantially longer. So I think in the interest of judicial economy, I think we're looking at an additional hour or two per day dealing with IT per protest day. Uh, which I don't know is in the best interest of the court. I understand the concerns, pr particularly with a mineral owner, uh, an oil company, big bad oil company comes in and says, no, you have to come to court today. I would propose that the uh, exception for protests only apply to mineral owners. If there is to be an exception at all, uh, I think that parties need to be present unless everybody consents to them um, being able to do it over the phone or over video conference. Thank you. Any other comments? All right. I, I think we got it. Some more comments. You're behind me. Thank you, Tom Schrader, on behalf of Oklahoma Industrial Energy Consumers, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak on these draft rules um, regarding the telephonic or video conferencing uh, rule changes. Um, I have a few, uh, one or two questions um, and then maybe one suggested change. Uh, looking at the rules, um, the title of 1-9 is telephonic or video conferencing testimony. And so that leads me to believe that, that this rule is limited to testimony that's going to be provided by telephone or video conference. Later on um, in the rule, I think in subparagraph C, it references arguments. Um, in other words, if there's not a stable connection, the administrative law judge or the commission may disregard the testimony or arguments. So my question is, is it contemplated that um, not only are we allowing uh, testimony, but also uh, arguments of counsel and counsel to appear by telephone or video conference. Is is this rule intended to uh, to accommodate um, attorneys uh, participating and making argument by video conference? So that's a that's a question, and I think it needs to be. Um, cleared up and and arguments needs to be deleted if it's uh, limited to um, to uh, witnesses. Um, my second um, point is in following up as uh, on Grayson's uh, comments. Um, there are times certainly when an attorney wants the witness um, in the room and um, to cross-examine that witness. The rule now provides subparagraph A that uh, in a hearing um, testimony may be offered by telephone or video conferencing unless the commission or administrative law judge determines that the president's presence of the witness is necessary. And so there's really no procedure for um, a party to challenge uh, presentation by telephone or video conferencing. And so um, if I wanted to present or if I wanted to uh, cross-examine a specific witness, I would want to be able to tell the commission or the administrative law judge why 
and then the commission or the administrative law judge could make that determination. But I would want to be able to present that, and I would want to be able to present that perhaps, um, Mary Beth, at the pre-hearing conference, um, or maybe on a motion docket. Um, at some point prior to the hearing, I would want to be able to make my um, objections known. And so uh, my final comment is on subparagraph G, um, the new uh, subparagraph G says, the party of records attorney shall be responsible for announcing at docket call those parties who plan to testify or otherwise participate by telephone or video conferencing connection. I would say that that's, uh, number one, that that's maybe too late. I, I don't, not practicing in the conservation division docket, I'm not knowledgeable in what a docket call is, but on the public utility division side, um, that that rule really doesn't work because we really don't have a docket call. And so um, I would say that the party of records attorney should um, respond, be responsible for advising the parties at the latest at the pre-hearing pre conference, um, maybe before that. But anyway, that that is just food for thought and items that I'd like you to consider. Thank you. I appreciate you calling our attention to the fact that we did not update our heading of the rule to be consistent with our moving on with technology in this day and age. We will certainly take care of that. That's not a problem. Um, with regard to the time for announcing that a party will be appearing by um, telephone or video conferencing, make a good point. As you know, the public utilities side is very different than the oil and gas side. And so that might be something we want to write into our pre-hearing conference or our procedural schedules on the public utilities side that any announcements or any identification of witnesses to be testifying by video or by telephone we've done prior to the time of the hearing at the pre-hearing conference, for instance. Good. Okay. Mary Beth, the, the, the comment Thank that you. Tom brought up about what if a party wants to challenge prior to hearing, I mean, it seems like that could go on, you know, oil and gas and utilities. So is is that envisioned in this? And if it is, I mean, it seems like shouldn't there be a process stated because um, it's it, it seems to me like the, it just as a commissioner, I know I'd want to hear if somebody has a problem with somebody testifying by telephone, but I need them to give the basis for it, not just saying I don't like it and I don't want it. So Certainly that may, should be something perhaps we consider as part of the pre-hearing um, conference memo that's mm -hmm. done on the oil and gas side where they identify how long they're going to take for the hearing and such and identify the issues we raised. And then I, I think his point, too, about the argument component, because I think about the arguments that are in front of the commissioners, you know, what if a couple attorneys want to be here and somebody else wants to be somewhere else? I mean, I would think that if somebody has to be out of town, we could, you know, try to accommodate it. But what is the goal for testimony? Is the goal about the attorney arguments? I mean, what? so I don't know what the goal is for the rule. I think the goal is that anybody who wishes to participate off-site in the commission has the opportunity to do that, recognizing they do so at the risk of not having a good connection or not being perhaps as um, well presented as if they were actually in front of the commissioners. You know, some there's some risk to be taken knowing that you're a talking head on the screen as opposed to standing the podium with both hands on it very firmly. Okay, I just I, I think some of the things that have been raised are just kind of thoughtful things and for us to think about in the title and and you know maybe some of the other suggestions. Okay. Commissioners, if I may, I have just kind of a, a follow-up comment from the oil and gas conservation side. I think as a matter of course, the attorneys that practice on the conservation docket and the PUD docket um, 
uh, the pollution docket, rather. I think that, as a matter of course, they'll be objecting to any telephonic testimony in a protested case simply because you cannot effectively cross-examine someone over the phone. It's a huge advantage for the off-site individual that's testifying, and I think that's a valid concern in any kind of testimony that warrants cross-examination, which is any testimony that's presented at a protested case. And so I would strongly consider removing protest from it. I understand Mr. Schrader's comments, and I think at least if that's fleshed out before the protest date, it would be beneficial. Um, if I'm looking to delay something, which I don't do, but if an attorney were to do so, I'd just start objecting to people testifying over the phone, and then you have a whole day talking about who can testify and where they can testify from. Um, and so it, at the very least, this needs to be fleshed out at the pre-hearing conference, I think, um, to announce that the day of the hearing uh, leads to not having a hearing that day, I think. Thank you. Thank you. All right, there on page four, we're wanting to correct an oversight in our um, filing fees. We have always charged the gas gathering docket the same amount of filing fee as is charged to the conservation docket and the pollution docket. And for whatever reason, we overlooked that when we did our rulemaking regarding fees. And so now we have nothing in our rules regarding the gas gathering docket. Now let me just say that we don't have a lot of these every year. I think we had fewer than 10 last year. But we would like to clarify that the gas gathering docket would be paying the same filing fee of $200 as the conservation docket and pollution docket. I don't have a comment about that, but under the oil and gas fees, when I look under S, and I went back to the existing rules just to clarify on items I, V, and V, where it says from 101 to 200 wells at 750 and from 201 to 500 wells at 750, I think it ought to just say from 101 to 500 wells at 750. I don't think we need those two lines because they're the same. They're on page five? Yes. I think at one time there might have been a different dollar amount envisioned, but to me as I understand what our current rules are, if you have from 101 to 500 wells, you pay the 750. If it's over 500, it's 1,000. So I don't know why we need those two lines for the same amount. Thank you for calling to our attention. I had not noticed that. Nor had I until I saw the Chapter 5 rules come out. Okay. Anything else regarding that rule? Okay, moving over to page 8, 5-5-1. We want to expand the explanation of what a consumer services docket is to better identify what constitutes a retail public utility. Basically, anybody who provides electrical, natural gas, water, steam, or other regulated service, or telecommunications, that's simply a better explanation of what constitutes a regulated utility. Any comments? Yeah, my question on that is what about CO2 or other liquids or cotton gins or, you know, what are we, should we be, if we're trying to name everything, how should we, what should we do about that? I think we tried to incorporate the definition that was there in Title 152, which captures the natural gas and um, the electric and such. We will look at that for cotton gins. Because, you know, I mean, CO2 might be moving through a regulated pipeline. So I don't, I don't understand if it's just, if we're saying it's a regula regulated utility provider that moves things by pipeline or something like that. It just, I feel like we need to be thoughtful. We're trying to name all these different types of things. What about a regulated pipeline that moves other things that you don't have listed here? And then just the reference of, of cotton gin. So it was just a question. I don't, I didn't know what the goal of what was trying to be accomplished. But if you're trying to identify what moves through pipelines or whatever, then I think there's a problem. This language might not be inclusive enough. Okay. So, and then I had one other question in looking at these under 9A9, second line, where it's petroleum storage tank cases. This isn't a proposal for a change, but it just drew my attention to it. It says, causes initiated by the director of the petroleum storage tank division or any other party seeking relief 
And then when I look up at the oil and gas citation docket and some of these others, I don't see that language that has or other parties seeking relief. I don't know who that would be or why it's like that in petroleum storage tank cases, but it's not like that in some of the other divisions. So it just kind of drew my attention to it. I see one that says or other under 12, it says or other party with standing concerns, but I just, I just didn't understand. Like I said, it's not a proposal for change, but I don't understand the distinction. So I'm not suggesting we do or don't do something. I just think it's something that needs to be looked at to make sure we've got consistency. And if it's not consistency across the divisions, why, what the purpose is. We'll talk about that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, there on page 12, this is part of... 165 5-7-1 the signatures we propose to change the current process um, so that this notice of filing an application is signed by the attorney filing the application we have the names of the current commissioners printed at the bottom of the notice and this will eliminate the need to have the rubber file stamp done of the commissioner's signatures and then verification of that by the commission secretary and it will eliminate a lot of time being spent right now and this will be done be, be added to all the appendixes okay page 15 this is part of the chapter 70 rules as you know those are the rate case rules for public utility division and currently, the rules say that anything regarding a need for protective order or motions to intervene, any types of initial preliminary motions are set before the commission and bank because time's the essence. We'd like to change that to the administrative law judge instead of the commission and bank. It, it probably would take probably a lot easier to get things scheduled before the ALJ and get them up to the commissioners as opposed to setting things before the commission and bank. I, I think I understand the goal. My only thought would be what if there's one that the commissioners just want to hear? There's not any proviso in there because I know we've got some other rules that say it'll be set like this unless, you know, the commissioner or whatever deems otherwise or something like that. So there might be some instances where it would be faster if the commissioners want to just take it up themselves. So I don't know if there's, you know, some of that proviso language, just having this as the standard with the ability that if the commissioners want to hear it, they could. I know the language you're talking about mm -hmm. is there in the arguments on exceptions. Mm -hmm. And so we will look at that and see if we can't incorporate that in here. Right, because I, I understand what you're trying to do, and I think that's great. It's just there might be those circumstances where something might be different. We haven't really provided for that here. Sure. Okay, there on page 16 is part of 5-9-4, Intervention and Parties of Record. We already have a list of people who may become a party of record by filing an entry of appearance or orally stating an appearance and it's been requested that the Oklahoma State Auditor and Inspector be added to the list of people who become a matter, a, a party of record by simply filing an entry of appearance rather than filing a motion to intervene. Any well, questions? I actually saw the Auditor and Inspector myself at the County Officer and Deputy Association meeting. So she said she didn't, wasn't aware of it and um, I know Commissioner Anthony suggested it. She said she'd be happy to have a, a discussion about it, and she left me her direct line as a phone number, which I can provide to Commissioner Anthony, because I think she didn't understand and she'd like to have a, a discussion about it. So she didn't really express an opinion. She just didn't know anything about it. Thank you. All right, there on page 19. 165 5-13-3 we had added last year there in paragraph S3 that the ALJ could dismiss a application upon notice of the parties for failure to submit a order timely 
and it was brought to our attention that we probably should limit that to parties of record as opposed to parties and have a discussion as when not all those respondents might possibly require notice prior to the dismissal. So this would limit the notice having to go to the dismissal, having to go to the party or parties of record and allow it to be done by electronic mailing. Any questions? Say this new system where you can be in your office and watch all this streaming is so fascinating. You can make phone calls and other things too. Um, I just thought I might point out there's a place in the statute that says that the state auditor, when they're performing certain audits, are supposed to uh, make certain considerations for each agency. But more so than that, in the Constitution and Article 9, uh, and I don't have that right in front of me, but uh, it talks about certain information that, uh, yes, I know you gave me the phone number for Cindy Bird, but if she gets shot down, um, I, I don't know that I need to bother her if, if we're not receptive to it in the first place. Um, anyway, in the Constitution, it provides under one particular uh, section <clears throat> that the uh, information shall be given to the state auditor. So here you have Article 9, it's all about the Corporation Commission, and it explicitly mentions the state auditor. Now, what are we talking about anyway? We're talking about streamlining regulation. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Um, Mary Beth, what is the difference between the system for just any old intervener and the Attorney General as set forth in these um, rules now? The Attorney General simply files an entry of appearance and they're automatically in as a party of record. Right. Uh, would you say that's simpler and more streamlined and saves them time and effort? Now, the other people, what do they have to do? They have to file paperwork. They have to come to a hearing. Somebody might protest it. They could uh, tell us a little bit more about the uh, what others do so that we can compare and see what a slick deal the Attorney General has. Well, others must contact the other parties and ask if there's any objection to the intervention there's no objection, they can simply file an entry of appearance saying, I've contacted people, there's no concerns about it, and they're in. Right. If there's any concerns, then they must file a motion to intervene, and that gets set for hearing. Okay. Um, and we're talking about here public utility cases. Now, somebody might say, well, it doesn't say that on it, but um, we looked into this once before, and Part of the definition is who has rights to notice. And on oil and gas, uh, there's already provision for notice, so that doesn't uh, trigger uh, that. So it, it, I'm just telling you the way it's written, it, this issue has to do with public utility cases. I know on oil and gas cases, people are somewhat reluctant to have a whole bunch of uh, miscellaneous interveners. We don't have to decide this today, but uh, since you, Mary Beth, have been here a long time, do you know which commissioner made the recommendation that we have this streamlined approach for the Attorney General? The longest sitting commissioner in the United States. You got it right. It was my idea. Hey, if we're not going to be as kind to the state auditor, as I would like, then I think we ought to take it away from the Attorney General. They got more attorneys and let them go through all that paperwork so they'll see how uh, others have to suffer. Okay. It's, I think uh, if we're trying to help the auditor and inspector, we probably ought to ask them first. Really? That'd be my thought. Maybe she's, we, she's asking for a phone call because she didn't know anything about it. I'll be, uh, I don't, okay. Um, maybe we ought to uh, uh, certainly do that. But if you've got your mindset that you're not for it anyway, if she says, yeah, that'd be really nice, 
are you willing to vote for it? I think before we try to add another state elected official to our rules, I think we should ask them. I mean, we wouldn't want them to add our name to something without talking to us. So I, I think she just wants to have a discussion and want to know what no, you're I, thinking I about. I get that. Yeah. If she says, that's a great idea, I'd like to do what the Constitution says. I wasn't really even as aware of it. Do, then do you think it was something you could support? we got other things to work on. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Bottom of page 19. 165, 5-13-5, exceptions to the report of the ALJ. There in paragraph A, it proposes to remove the transportation-related cases as being those which are not able to be set for oral argument for the Commission Bank as a matter of right. We had added previously administrative law judge in several other places in this rule and it's our proposal as of this afternoon to take that ALJ out of there because sometimes there's a conflict of interest with our um, oil and gas appellate referee. We need to be able to assign an ALJ to hear some of those things. And so we would keep the administrative law judge in there. But this would simply, there in paragraph A, allow that transportation cases as a matter of right could be set before the commissioners, but of course they still have to file a motion to have it heard by the commissioners. Just this just has be. a long history. It was like this before. Yes, it was. Then it got changed, and now the Mr. Schneider's asking for it to go back the way it was. So he's the one asking for it. I know this. You all aren't right. This was his suggestion, right, yes, ma'am? But it's. To go yes. back to the way that it was. C correct. And we can all talk about when that was. Not right now. So, okay. Um, contempt. There, page 21. We would like to provide that service of citations and return of service is sent to the respondent's registered agent and listed with the Oklahoma Secretary of State, in addition to sending it to the last known address as listed in the commissions of record. We think that this will enhance the due process um, capability for citations. Any comments regarding this? Okay, there in, let's see, moving over to page 23, the consumer services complaints this is a new process. I'll let Mr. Klein explain that. As of right now, there's actually no process in place for when a consumer wants to file a consumer services complaint. Uh, there is, this, of course, the CS docket, but there's no process for it. So causes oftentimes get filed and sit until uh, the ALJ wants it to be heard and sets it for a hearing. So this will actually set up a process and help the consumer by basically telling them, when you want to file a complaint, you, do, you have to do these certain steps to, to actually get to a hearing. It will also guarantee that a hearing will occur within a certain number of days. It'll allow for a lot of flexibility for an administrative law judge to continue a case to a date certain. Uh, and it also allows for, uh, of course, a hearing on the merits and then exceptions to be filed if needed. Are there any questions on this? And one of the items that is not included here. There'll be an appendix item added regarding the notice of hearing uh, that was not prepared in time for today's meeting. The last thing in Chapter 5 are all of the appendixes there, with the exception of G, which proposes to make a change there in the caption. The majority of these changes, or all the changes, are to simply remove the signature line for the commissioners with the secretary um, affixing the signature and change it to a typewritten name of the commissioners and then also add an attorney signature block for each of these. We did add there in the witness identification form, Appendix J, that the witness would testify they were provided copies of all documents and the testimony was unassisted and not prompted or directed by any person. Any questions or changes to that, to those appendices? 
with that, that's Chapter 5. I'll turn it over to Susan Conrad. Thank you, Mary Beth. My name is Susan Conrad. I'm a staff attorney uh, here at the Corporation Commission. Just want to introduce some uh, people. Uh, to my left is Robin Strickland, the director of the Commission's Oil and Gas Conservation Division. Uh, next to Ms. Strickland is Bob McCoy, the technical program coordinator for the Technical Services Department. Next to Mr. McCoy is Everett Plummer, a field inspector supervisor. Uh, at the next table over is uh, Brad Ice, the manager of the Commission's District 2 office. Um, next to Mr. Plummer is uh, Jim Marlatt, the, the manager of the Field Operations Department. Directly across from me is Patricia Downey, manager of the Underground Injection Control Department. Uh, next to Ms. Downey is Charles Lord, manager of the Induced Seismicity Department. And next to Mr. Lord is um, uh, Sean Coslett, manager of the Pollution Abatement Department. And at the table behind me is Duncan Woodliff, who is uh, the manager of the Production Proration Department. And uh, we will be going through the Chapter 10 draft amendments. These are draft amendments as of August 15, 2019. And Susan, I have just a general question. If you were to give us, like, just, uh, I've, I've gone through all of them. I've read, looked at all of them, and I'm, I will probably have comments. But if you could make kind of a, a broad general statement of what the Chapter 10 rules these changes are designed to accomplish. In 5, it was a little easier because there weren't so many. But what would you say in general, if you could make a statement to us and to the people here, what, what's, what's the goal or what do they generally cover? The changes. Uh, okay. Um, I believe that the uh, draft amendments are intended to update the uh, Commission's rules um, in accordance with um, uh, changing technology. Yeah, but I mean, I, I guess I see it a little more than that. It seems like there's some where there are tweaks, where you take out the fine amounts, and there's some where the pollution abatement is added instead of the manager of field operations. You know, those are kind of that's what I was asking for. I mean, those aren't technology updates. Those would be um, changes that, you know, I, I'm assuming there's a basis for it. And then there's some where it's an entire overhaul of a certain particular um, area to me that I don't, again, I think that has to do with just the changing dynamics of how oil and gas operations are conducted. And then in some cases I see a move away from flow backwater and then I see another place, well, we didn't eliminate flow backwater here. So, and then we've added a, a bunch of definitions. So some of it, that was really what I was looking for is it just seems like there's a lot and I'm just thoughtful that we've been, um, we've, done a lot on the oil and gas side. The rules, I think, have been pretty robust for year after year after year after year. I'm a little bit concerned about making sure we have what we need and what, you know, the division thinks that we need. But to try to just throw everything together because, oh, we saw this and we think that needs to be changed too, is under, us to understand what are the priorities, what do we really what do we really need? Is it is it concern about the pits? Is it concern about injection wells? Is it concern about a lot of different things? And being thoughtful of how many changes we are proposing at a time that I think is kind of challenging. And the challenging time may necessitate some of the changes, but that's just been a little bit of my concern after I, I did. I sat down and I went through all the rules. Okay. Um, well, thank you, Commissioner, and um, uh, perhaps uh, as we go through the, the proposed rules and the staff members address the rationale, uh, that may um, uh, provide some information. Okay. And, and, uh, yes. um, Will Hauser with Marathon Oil. Uh, Commissioner, I'd first like to thank everybody for uh, work on the rules and, and being here today, but uh, just a suggestion, it might be helpful if we could prioritize the Chapter 10 rules in some way so we could focus on those that the staff needs to, to streamline and work efficiently and effectively going forward. Because as you mentioned, there are just a large number of rules to be trying to deal with, I think, in one rulemaking. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hauser. The 
first uh, set of proposed changes are on pages one and two to definitions, definitions of class two fluids and uh, a, new, a new definition and uh, revising definition of commercial disposal well. Mr. Lord, can you address those? Uh, yes, the uh, class two oh. fluid. Uh, um, yes, change the class two fluids. It uh, defines what the class two fluids are, brines, deleterious fluids, which are brought to surface. Uh, this is more in line with uh, uh, EPA definitions. Um, the next is uh, commercial disposal well. Our definition was really kind of nebulous. Uh, originally, it was means a class two injection well where the operator receives and disposes of produced water or any deleterious substance from multiple well operations and receives compensation and where the operator's primary business objective is to provide these services. Uh, there'd be a lot of wells that, uh, there aren't that many non-commercial wells that would qualify as commercial under this. Changing the definition to any operator who disposes of class two fluids and receives compensation for these services. Yes. I'm a little concerned about the the microphone. Um, the microphone. Thank you. There. Thank you. Uh, about the definition as far as just and receives compensation for these services. Mm -hmm. If I'm an operator and I have other working interest owners, I'm charging them for disposing in this well. Am I not receiving compensation? Is it your intent to make these commercial? Disposal wells? No, if they're pay paying their pro rata share of costs of disposal, then that's that's we would not consider that to be a commercial disposal. Our primary purpose always has been in UIC is to prevent uh, water from going down the creek, uh, trying to make certain that it's safely disposed of. Yeah. We do know there are areas where operators will. Uh, put together resources and have a well, and uh, one well for multiple operators and dispose in that. And if, there's, if they're sharing pro rata costs, then they're not, this is not for profit. I would not consider that to be a commercial dispute. I think the language <laughs> might need to be adjusted a little bit yeah. based on what you've indicated. Just like to be clarified. Right. Thank you. The next change is on page 15, and that is to incorporate a reference the most recent Chapter 10 rulemaking and its effective date. Susan. Susan, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Bud Grant I'm sorry, Brad. The Petroleum Alliance of Oklahoma, I, I wasn't quite quick enough getting up, and um, I was wanting to. Uh, Actually, back on that class two fluids, but first I want to say that uh, the Petroleum Alliance agrees with uh, Commissioner Murphy, and we'd, we would really like to uh, be very precise in what we change, and we, so we don't have any unintended consequences from changes, uh, as she says, that, which could be challenging. So we wanted to support that. But I do have a question on this class two fluids, and it, because it does talk about conventional oil and gas production, and is that meant to be? a defined term or um, is that just, you know, compared to unconventional oil, oil, um, oil and gas production? Uh, well, I, w I would think it would include anything. Oh. If you're talking about unconventional, are you talking about uh, huff and puff or, or anything? I'm just, I'm, if it if it were to be included and it would be considered unconventional, would that actually be still part of this class two fluids? Um, well, I'm trying to. What? Uh, maybe I'm losing. What? What would you classify as unconventional? Um, I, I, I don't even know what the whole scope might be, but if it were considered an unconventional um, well, are those still considered class two fluids? Uh, Is that really meant to be a, a defined term, conventional? Um, well, yeah, it's 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 defining what class two fluids are. Uh, Anything brought to surface, uh, either VOC, oil, um, salt, brine. Okay. Uh, uh, and in the fluids, 
that would include H2S, uh, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen, anything else that would be brought up. Okay. I, I just wanted to make sure that I understood that okay. and that it was clear. Next set of changes are to prescribed forms 10 1 7 on page 19. Uh, Mr. Woodliff, could you address that? Okay. Okay, yes. Yeah, so what this rule is, it's uh, about a form which uh, was used in the past, and we're finding now that they're really. In our opinion, doesn't seem to be you know, much use for this anymore. It uh, confer, uh, concerns the Form 1007A, which was an annual reporting of unallocated gas wells where they uh, posted an annual shut-in pressure and a date on there. Uh, it goes hand-in-hand uh, -hand with uh, one that we're planning to eliminate uh, later on in here, uh, be Rule 10-17-16. but. Uh, what it amounts to is that we have really not had any uh, interest in that. No one has uh, sought out any interest on any of these uh, pressures at all. Uh, most of these uh, wells uh, really are some of the old uh, disconventional uh, vertical wells that are producing in a lot of the zones, and they're pretty much dying, depleting out. They're not informative uh, as far as we can tell uh, or much help to anybody at this stage right here. Uh, the thing is, is that, uh, you know, Woodford wells, you know, you see most of uh, the wells which are being drilled now are Woodford and uh, associated reservoirs in Mississippi and Hunt and Caney, so forth. And these, uh, really, uh, these wells are just limited to some of the old wells which are pretty much uh, depleting and, and marginal. And we feel that this uh, 1007A form has is, is basically lived out its purpose, but it's been quite a burden. Um, as far as uh, having operators submit this on an annual basis, and uh, frankly, they, not many of them are still doing that, and it's one of the, the rules which are still on the books, and we feel that uh, this uh, real form ought to be uh, taken out. Okay. The next uh, proposed changes are on pages 21 and 22. Sean, can you address those? Uh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> Later on, we'll be going through a rule on 10716 Part F, which we will need to have a name change to our form 1014F for permit to use flowback water pits in excess of 50,000 barrels. Uh, I'll get in depth later on when we get to the heart of that rule, but we would like to drop the word flowback water and add non commercial pits to this section. What's the, you know, Sean, because I, I saw in some of the subsequent rules the flowback language wasn't dropped from all of it. I don't know if it was inadvertent, but I found at least one place. So what's, um, what is the reason that we are removing it or why do we have it or, you know, I, I understand the per I understand why you want to do it, but what, what's the kind of foundation for it? Uh, these pits are used throughout Oklahoma for completion activities on in various well locations. Uh, not all the what goes into those pits is not just flowback water. It's sometimes it's produced water, and we just need to del delineate that in the rule to make it legal, essentially. Okay, so it would still would it would it be like is it going to be like considered um, class two type water? Does it fall under that, or will there be a problem that we don't have? We're just saying a non-commercial pit, so anybody could think that they could put any kind of water in it. Yes, any kind of water. But only water that we regulate. Correct. So that would be my only thought about when we change that, if we're clear on that, so that if somebody dumps some kind of water that we don't actually regulate, do we have the ability to take action on that? I, that? That's just my question. And again, I, you know, I'm not against it. I'm just trying to understand it and make sure if we're changing this, is it going to be clear what we're doing and what kind of water we would is not allowed? Yes, it'll be water that flows through the well bore that okay. is either recycled, clean to a quality that they can use in completion activities. Okay, or for so temporary storage. That's my only thought, Susan. I, I don't know that we. I don't know if we need to add that or not. But the way that this is left, it, it seems like to me there's not really any type of delineation of the type of water. Now I understand that it's only what's in our purview, but I just don't know if we need to add somewhere that 
for all these rules we're changing, this is what it means, and so you don't have to put it into every single rule. Do you know what I mean? If you had some general water that comes from the well bore or whatever we regulate is at the front, and then everybody knows that then that would be inclusive all the way through. I don't know how to do that, but that's just a general thought. Ready? The uh, next um, change, proposed change is on page 23 to um, delete the form 1015T. And um, Jim or Brad, would you all like to address that? Uh, this is on page 23, the deletion of the form 1015T. This is the strike through on um, page 23 of subsection 56. Um, Susan, before we get there on 22, I noticed that we're changing manager of field operations to pollution abatement on the truck wash pits, which that seems to make sense to me that it would fall under, you know, kind of Sean's area. But I know that I think that changes all throughout, but this is kind of where it starts, and I'm, I'm understanding that throughout the rules in Chapter 10, there's a change from field operations to pollution abatement where it involves pits of whatever type they seem to be. Is that accurate? Um, Sean, can you address that? Yes. We was planning on moving uh, truck washout pits and 1014F pits, which are large 50,000 barrel or more pits, to the pollution abatement department for technical review. And would it still require, like, some of the field inspectors to go out there and look at things and report to you or Jim, or how would that work as far as do you, do you have people in your department that would go out there, or how would that work? Uh, both departments would and do look over those facilities. Okay. Jim, the, uh, on page 23, the uh, proposed deletion of the Form 1015-T application for injection of reserve pit fluids, um, would you like to address that? Well, the, the reserve pit fluids, the striking that uh, application for the on-site injection of reserve pit fluids, I'm not sure why I'm being asked to. Uh, okay. yes. or, or if Charles would this, like to address this. Is formal, this okay. has been a practice in the past, uh, but with uh, land applications uh, of uh, drilling fluids, it's it's really I, I don't believe it's necessary. We don't we have very few 1015 T's coming through. I was never particularly wild about it in the first place because they're taking it and injecting this between the uh, surface casing and production casing annulus. Uh, I, I believe it needs to be removed. Yes? Righty. On page 25, there's a, a proposed a deletion of the Form 1036A. Uh, Jim, could you address that? Now, the Form 1036A is the old citation book the field inspectors use that limited each, uh, if they were on a site inspection with multiple violations, they would have to write multiple citations. We've added the, the incident report, the Form 1085, which allows for all, of, all the violations to be listed in one place. So we've eliminated the use of that, so we're eliminating the form from the, from the rules. And then uh, the citations were also tied to fines that were listed on the Schedules A and B. Uh, the citation itself actually only referenced Schedule A fines. So we've, uh, throughout the rules, there's going to be several of the fines that are actual amounts listed, and those are being struck out. And then we're dropping the uh, Appendix E Schedule A and Schedule B fines. Um, on the issue of the fines, because I saw the numbers, I mean, it had been changed before. We used to have an amount, and then it was said up to an amount so that when the judges heard cases, if they had flexibility to, you know, make a different amount. But I know in, in uh, the PST department, there's kind of a fine schedule. Do we have anything like that? Um, I know that we've got that constitutional issue about what we can find, but does this make it where the companies don't have any idea what we would find them? I mean, should do we have a fine schedule, or what, what's your thoughts about that? 
we don't have we don't have a fine schedule. There's pieces of a fine schedule that are kind of tied to the citation books and, and mm-hmm. quite dated. And as things have changed, many of the rules don't have fines. More more do not. If there's violations, there's no fines associated with them. And in order to align things, you know, with the statutory limit of five thousand dollars, that's that's a an upper limit. But we don't have uh, we don't have a complete fine schedule for every event because pollution events are all different. There's not uh, there's not just one one fine fits a different different problem. Right, and I think what was in the rules was just to be where there was at least some cap on what the fine could be because it was up to an amount. So um, I don't know what is best or whatever, but I I would think that you might want to see if any industry people want to talk about that because when you look at this now, there's there's no indication of any type of what it would be. So maybe that's the best way to do it. I don't really know, but I, I th- think just to make sure you probably ought to see if any industry folks have any suggestions because – if it's unlimited in what the fine amounts could be other than what's allowed, you know, that might be concerning. I'm, you know, I don't know. I think it's up for them to bring it up to you. I don't have a suggestion for what it should be, but I just I noticed that that was changed all throughout the rules. Yes, we'll do that. Grayson Barnes again. I'm sorry, commissioners. I don't think if I thought I thanked you guys for being here earlier. And Miss Snap and Miss Conrad, thank you as well for all the work and time that's gone into the rules. I was a little nervous earlier. I had to be here in person today, and usually I call in for these things. <laughs> um, anyways, regarding the fines, I think a schedule just gives the, the operators some insight as to the commission's concern with that particular kind of violation. And if everything is a $5,000 fine potentially, then what's more concerning, what's less concerning. If something's a $50 fine, well, obviously they don't want to incur the $50 fine or have whatever that issue is, but it gives the operator some insight as to the commission's level of concern as to that particular violation. Um, And so even maybe just like a a schedule as to your um, concern with compliance, not necessarily putting a cap on it, but schedule one, two, and three or something along those lines might give a little bit more guidance uh, if there's not an actual cap that um, you guys would like to associate with the specific violations. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just brought up the question because this is one of the things that I just wondered, is it needed in this rulemaking session or is it something that needs a little more discussion and it can be brought up later? That was the only reason I mentioned it. Thank you. Um, Page 28, uh, there's addition of a new form, a proposed new form 6000 NHF Notice of Hydraulic Fracturing Operations. Uh, Charles, would you like to address that? Uh, I'm getting the the drift of this. Um, Operators required to notify other operators of the Conservation Commission prior to commencement of hydraulic fracturing. Uh, This has become particularly important with uh, induced seismicity from well completion. It also, uh, from preventing interference, uh, well completion interference with other other holes in the area. Um, And uh, we're we're trying to get this into a, a form that we can process more easily. Uh, Kim Hatfield, and uh, do we have a, a time frame for notification associated with this? Uh, no, not as written. I, could you recommend a time frame? Uh, for an operator, an offset operator, to take meaningful action to uh, uh, secure their well, uh, you probably need a week's notice. And that's to pre- prepare their well for the impending well right. completion, yeah. offset well completion. Right. Okay. And uh, begging the court's indulgence, I, I need to go back to the uh, injecting of pit fluids. Uh, you don't have many of them now. And I don't anticipate you're going to see many in the future, 
but there are places where land application is really problematical and really expensive, and in those cases, it makes uh, annular injection is a is a reasonable thing to do. Okay, I would just uh, um, <clears throat> Susan, just let me know that in part three, on page 42, we do address hydraulic fracturing. Uh, that five days business notice commencement hydraulic fracturing should be given to operators of uh, producing wells within one mile of okay. the I'm glad she agrees with me. <laughs> okay. Okay, so was your other comment, Kim, on leaving in that form 1015T? Right, it's not, not frequently used uh, today, but there are areas of the state where land application is uh, problematical at best and expensive, uh, maybe very expensive. And in those cases, the uh, annual injection should be a, a, a permitted practice. Um, thank you for your comment. <laughs> <laughs> because we're talking about really de minimis volumes compared to, this is not like it's a, uh, a disposal well or something. Thank you, Cam. The uh, next uh, proposal, 10-1-10 um, operators agreement, um, there's a proposal on page 30 to require uh, e uh, operators to file uh, email addresses to the commission to expedite and simplify the uh, contact of the operators. On page 31, uh, Financial statement is surety 10-1-11. There's a proposed addition of uh, uh, filing of operators agreements with completed attached schedules. Um, Susan, on this issue, I, I just I see it as a much bigger issue. Um, some of the forms we have, when I actually looked at them, I don't know that they would actually work that well with the new system that's going in place. Large chunks of empty space on the forms actually show up. And it might be, I'm not saying I'm against that, but it seemed like, I don't like doing financial statement assurity. I think most people know that, but the statute says we have to do it, and I know our staff's done a really good job of doing that, so I have no criticism there. But if we're going to look at making a little thing to tweak it, maybe we ought to be doing something that's meaningful to it. And I'm just wondering, one of the ones that I had actually seen that was actually rejected for not filling out a box, it would have been sufficient to get a loan from a bank based on all the details, and it had an independent um, evaluation by, I think, a, an independent registered engineer. Like, if you took that document to the bank, that would be a document they could give you a loan on. But because one part, which I don't remember what it was, was not filled in, it was rejected. So it just made me wonder, we keep changing the form and adding requirements to it, and are we making sure it matches up to what we should be doing under the statute and under our rules? I don't have a suggestion for changing it. I'm just bringing up the concept of that might be something that we want to have a discussion on, because at some point in time, something's going to have to be done about financial statements given the number of operators that we've seen go out of business and then we are left with a lot of plugging liability. So I'm not saying that it needs overhauled, but I just wonder if it's something that needs to have a little more time spent on it with maybe a group from the industry or the staff at some point in time. Maybe not this session, but at some point. Thank you. The Next, uh, proposed changes are on page 32, uh, proposed amendments to 10-1-15, transfer of operatorship of wells. And um, Jim, would you like to address that? Yes, the, the changes to uh, look at if there's an open 1085 complaint on a well, that before the well's transferred, the district manager would be contacted to make sure that the operator is going to 
is able to take on more wells. They're not a, having problems with other things. We want to make sure that we're not transferring wells from one, one operator to another where they're both having issues and, and not able to take on additional things. If you're taking on a well that has a problem, it, it needs to be fixed. And we're having, we're having issues with that at this time where there's wells are just being shifted around because the deadline's coming up on the 1085 before it goes to court. So we're wanting to make sure that we can view who's transferring the wells before we approve it. Do we need to specify who the burden is on? Is it on us to be looking to find it out? Or is it that we ask and they have to tell us? Or what, what's the method or the process for, for checking? I, I support what you're trying to do. It's just if I'm trying to transfer a well to somebody and I don't have any contempt citations against me, but the person that I'm transferring it to does, and I don't have any way of knowing that, and then the staff has a problem with it. What, I mean, who, who's, who's the burden on? Is it up to the staff to research and look at this, or what, what, how would the process work? Yeah, yeah the well records department, the, when they get a transfer in, they currently look at those and see if they're open incidents. We've, we've done that before just to make sure there's no incident open that actually has an order of the commission that needs to be taken care of before we can transfer the well, because that's the way the rule was written, it, if it's in violation of an order of the commission. So, okay, and what if I'm going to be the receiver of the well and the person transferring, the company transferring the well has got this contempt citation or some issue that's not fixed, and I'm the company that's going to take the well on, but I'm willing to sign an affidavit or I'm willing to whatever kind of documentation to let you know that I recognize that and I'm willing to take the well on even with this issue and for it to become my responsibility. Is there an exception for that or would that happen or how would that work? Well, still, they, they would review it and contact the district manager and say, this operator who we know has these issues going on is wanting to transfer these wells to, to, to your company in this case, and you don't have any problems. Managers will look at that and make sure there's no, they don't have any issues with it, and they'll either, you know, they, they would approve the transfer in that case if there's no open incidents. If they see lots of open incidents on an operator, they're going to review what those are and, and the historical background behind those incidents to see. But if you had no open incident incidents, then they would they would approve the transfer. Okay, so like take this example, and this is one that's just coming to my mind. I'm a small little company, and I just bought three or four hundred wells from a large company. Um, the question is, whether there is some of the wells are not producing, maybe there hasn't been a plug or produce filed against it, the issue of whether this little company has the bandwidth to take on the liability for all these different wells. Um, I know that's something that this, the commission hasn't really dealt with before, but I think it's something that is becoming a much bigger issue. Companies taking on other companies' well that they just, then they go out of business or they walk away from the wells um, I don't know that that's something we try to address in this rulemaking, but I think it's something that's a problem, and I think the problem is growing. So I, I think it kind of ties in directly to this, but it seems to me that if I'm the company receiving the wells and it's got some kind of a problem on it, then I would need, the commission would need to have something in writing that that company would take on the liability. Couldn't I don't think you could do this verbally or orally, and if I'm the company taking on the wells, I've you know, I would want to make sure I've got full disclosure because I might not know that they've got these 1085 violations because I haven't seen them. So I just think to be thoughtful about who the burden is on and to be clear about how we're doing it. But I'm supportive of what you're trying to do. I just wondered about the, the details of it. Okay. Thank you. The next uh, proposed changes are on page uh, 33, and uh, there's a proposal for an operator requesting a permit to drill for a well, and the word uh, horizontal is stricken through. Bob, could you address that? It's important for us to have the plats when we receive the application so we can make sure we have the correct uh, uh, surface casing and pit requirements needed. A lot of the times we'll get uh, 
applications that do not have the correct location or they're spotted wrong and having the plat will ensure that we give the correct information. Okay, well, if we're doing that, I think there might need to be another change in four because the last line of that says proposed horizontal well. That needs to be removed too then. So basically it would be no matter what type of well you're drilling, vertical, directional, or horizontal, everyone has to do a plat. That's correct. Okay. And that would probably be, is that going to be a significant change for vertical operators? I know the horizontal operators are used to doing it. I'm not sure. Uh, Dan Walkup has told me he has lots of problems with operators not having the correct location, and he has to make several phone calls to try to get the answer. So having a plat would eliminate him having to communicate with them. Okay. The next proposed changes are on page 35, 10-3-2, uh, notification of spudding of new wells. And Jim, do you have some thoughts about that? On 10-3-2, uh, paragraph A, uh, the proposed change was to change it from within 14 days of spudding to a minimum 48 hours before and then discussions in the last week with in-house discussions and things that have been overlooked. They, they'd missed the impact of it on, on the different departments. Technical department really needs the spudding notice once it's actually spudded, not prior to, which, which makes more sense so they know that there's actually a hole in the ground at that point. The, so the first change in A, we would like to just leave it as what, as the rules were. With the, within 14 days after and strike out the change that was put in there. In Section D, we want to provide notice to the district offices. They're, they're the ones that need to know when there's going to be a sputter out there so they can make sure things are going as, as they're supposed to. So rather than uh, striking out all of Paragraph D, would be in addition to the notification of sputting of a new well as required in Section in B of this section, the operator shall notify the district office no less than 48 hours before the first boring of the hole. And we would still strike out the first setting of conductor pipe used for the sole purpose near surface stabilization of the, I'm sorry, uh, we'd leave that in up to when such operations are not continuous. And we would continue the strikeout of when such operations are not continuous with spudding operations as defined in Section B of this section. So they would get 48 hours notice on the spudding for conductor any time the spudding is going on. So there would, it's not just if it's conductor only spudding, but any spudding they'd get a 48 hour notice prior to. So I'm, I, I guess I'm still confused. So it's like don't go with the new changes. Go back to the way it was. So I know we've got some guys here that are actually out in the field. So has it been working the way it was, or what? what's the thought process? I mean, whatever you all think is the best way to do it and see what industry indicates. But I, I, did, I didn't really know why we were changing it or what is best. So how, how does it kind of work in the field? Yes, Commissioner. Uh, when we first changed this, we were thinking, okay, we could do away with two forms, make it easier for the industry with one. Uh, for as long as I've been here, the operators have been sending the district a spud notice. Yet nowhere in our rules does it say that they're required to do that, and it's very important that the, all, the districts get it. We need to know when they first start. Uh, uh, some of us have talked with industry. Uh, they're a little concerned with the 48 hours in case it fails. So what we'd like to do is we, more or less, we would just like to add that in the rules so it's there that the operators notify the district office, preferably by email or by phone. That's really what it kind of boils down to. Uh, the, the other part in there that kind of ties in with this is also in the rules it states that they're supposed to notify us of conductor setting. Uh, very few of them do that, and there is really no reason that we really need to know until they break the surface with the spud, uh, spud notice, set and surface casing, 
that's really, really when it becomes a well that we need to do something with. Okay, and so the the Jim said to go back to the 14 days after, and that that's the time frame that the, it works for the field. No, the the that is that's been in the rules. That's when they have to fill send the 1014 here to the commission. Okay. So they have 14 days from the date they spud to submit that. So that's after to give this yeah, Oklahoma yeah. City office notice. Yeah, yes, and that we want to leave that. From talking with technical and some of the operators, they would prefer to leave that. The field doesn't have a problem with that. Okay, and then you guys in the field need the 48-hour yeah. notice. And the operators have been doing that. We just think it's very important that it's in the rules because it is very important that the field knows when that drilling actually starts. So is it two types of forms, or is there a form no. that comes in the 48 hours? Each, each one of the districts has a very similar spud notice form. Uh, it, it is much easier for the operators for their convenience and for ours. It's an electronic form, an Excel spreadsheet or PDF has very minimal information on it because all we really need to know is which well is it and what day are you starting. Uh, we need to go out and check permits. We need to do the, you know, where the pits are going, make sure they're in the same location. If we wait 14 uh, in some areas, that rig's already gone. Uh, some of the deeper wells, it's not. All we're really asking is, you know, that simple notification. That way, if they send it on a late Friday, uh, we always reply back to them. We save those until that well is finished drilling, and then we can always go back to the 1014. It's just a, a way to notify, notify the district office in the field okay. that the drilling has started. So, Jim, it's sufficient to get the Form 101A in the Oklahoma City office 14 days after? Right. Yes, the 14 days 14 days after is sufficient. That allows technical to know that there is actual well in the ground as opposed to the change that was proposed initially. So we want to make sure that there has been a spudding that occurred, everything's in place, and the well has actually been set. Okay. It may not be completed, but there's there's the, the spudding of the well. Everett, I see that you're here and you're from a different district. Do you have any comment? Commissioner, thank you. I would agree with Brad. It is essential that we know the field knows ahead of time uh, to be able to address the concerns, as Brad said, and also if we start fielding calls from citizens as to what's going on, we know those things as well. Uh, I understand the concerns that were addressed. And the 48 hours, I believe, could be um, worked with because there could be a need for a variance in that if certain situations arose or a time frame. For an earlier time frame? For an earlier or perhaps if there's an issue that arises within that 48-hour window that's an unforeseen situation, they could get a variance from a district manager to have that approved to where it's not we certainly don't want to cost industry extra money for an un Okay. All right. Thank you. So I know, Jim, then I guess the next version will have the, the changes that you've talked about going back to or a modification of what's here, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I've, I've been working up the language. going to get it to Susan this afternoon. The next changes are, are to 10-3-3 well casing strings on page 36. Uh, Jim, Brad, and Everett, would you all like to address those? On you know, 10, 10 3, 3 well casing strings, we want to add in paragraph B, in the event of a rupture break or opening occurs in any casing string, the owner operator shall cease operations of that well, uh, which was not included in the changes uh, that were printed out, but we caught that yesterday when we did our final review, and take immediate action to repair it, and then notify the district office and strike out the manager of pollution abatement within 24 hours of discovery. And then the next change would be changing the uh, notice, the owner operator shall submit the written report within 48 hours from 10 business days, the written report being just the name, the well name, name of the operator, the date it was discovered, the circumstances, and the action plan taken or proposed. So within 48 hours, we want to have just the basic details of the site where the casing parting occurred and that there is a plan of action in place. And that can be emailed uh, to the district office. The 
next uh, proposed changes at 10 3 4 are on page 38. Jim, would you like to address those? And we're going to, we want to take out the uh, witnessing of setting a surface casing. Operators should give at least 24 hours notice by telephone. Just strike that out because it's not. Uh, it's not a, a realistic thing that we can uh, uh, we can we can receive notice that you're doing it. We've already got the spud notice. You know, we've got the spud notice. It's the same thing, so it's kind of a duplication. You know, if you're if you're spudding the well, they're out there. They know that that's going on, and we're not going to get to uh, not going to get to these in a timely fashion. Any different than the the spud notice? It's a duplication of efforts. Do, do we go out, I mean, do, do the field guys go out on any of these at all? No, ma'am. Okay. The, the, these are done either very late at night or very, very early in the morning just because of how these are set up. That's why we're asking to strike this. Uh, the, the other reason we'd like to strike this is they've gotten so efficient at this, by the time we get their spud notice, most of these, even with the deep surface casing, it's set within 24 hours, so the spud notice and this is really one thing anymore. That's why we'd like to strike it. Okay. And uh, Jim, the uh, additional, uh, the top of cement greater than 200 feet from the surface, if you can address why that is being uh, modified. So if uh, wanting to take out the, if conductor string has been set and the cement has been found to be 10 feet or more above the base of the conductor string, no corrective action is required if no conductor string has been set and portion of the paragraph and just make the top of cement greater than 200 feet from the surface. If the top of cement is greater than 200 feet from the surface, corrective action would be required and then strike out the, from a point 50 feet below to to the, from the base treatable water, you know, to be just by circulating cement from the determined top of cement, and make that the end of the sentence. So it would be if the top of cement is greater than 200 feet from the surface, the operator shall perform a corrective cementing operation by circulating cement to the surface from the determined top of cement. Okay. And. Um uh, Jim, Brad, or Everett, um, do you all have, uh, can you address why the changes are being proposed? We feel like it's very important environmentally that we do not leave that gap with no cement behind it in that surface casing. Uh, the, the industry also has gotten a lot better with, with their uh, cementing. They can run the one inch and cement and get a good cement job a lot better than they used to be able to. Their, their technology is unbelievable anymore. The next uh, proposed changes are on page 42, a notice of hydraulic fracturing operations. And Charles, you touched on it briefly, but could you address those? Um, yes, the 48-hour uh, notice uh, in the past was uh, given to the district office by uh, facsimile or posted note on the door or one posted under a windshield wiper, but it's since there's been the correlation between seismicity and well completion, this has now become critical. Uh, we're going to, currently we're, we're having operators that are turning in their uh, frac notices on a Excel sheet, which we will then process and then put it into our system for any spatial temporal correlation. Eventually, we're going to be going to a, a web-based, uh, ESRI-based uh, reporting. Uh, we originally had said 48 hours. We spoke with industry. They wanted 24 hours in case uh, they begin their start their pegging a well completion and they have to pull off and go to another location. However, I'd like to move it back to 48 hours. And, and I would, would like to let you guys know if you have one filed and you have to move to another, uh, we will give papal dispensation and you may go and send no more and frack that other well. Uh, but we would like to keep it at 48 hours. Okay. 
And Charles, the use of the uh, the electronic submission of the Form 6000 NHF to the Conservation Division, is that a, a more expedient way of, of uh, getting that information out to the uh, field and yes, others? Yes, it, it will change. We don't know exactly what it will look like at this point, but it will be much better than what we're using now. So are we saying the same form that goes to uh, operators uh, is the same form that's submitted to the commission, it's just different time frames? Um, yes, uh, Commissioner, I'm not sure the actual name of the form is going to be, it will wind up being the same, but uh, it's, it's referring to the FRAC notice. Okay, well, it uses the same form number if you're giving notice to operators of producing wells or if you're giving it to the commission. So I just wondered if it was the same form they fill out, it's just the time frame they provide it. Well, you're, you're quite right. It will be it will be a different form. Uh, Fragnos operators will not be filed on uh, electronic that comes into the ISD department. Okay. Well, the rule says you're using the same form for both, for one and two. Uh, well, thank you. We will change that. I just think people need to be clear on the operators need to understand. Can they fill out one form and they mail it or send it or whoever to the offset operator and then they, I, I think you just need to make it clear what they're expected to do and see if they have a comment about that. Okay. There are some changes, um, kind of uh, housekeeping measures, uh, 10316 operation hydrogen sulfide areas on page 46. There are some amendments to that rule um, um, in the most recent Chapter 10 rulemaking. Uh, there were references to, uh, on, this is on page 46, uh, to B7. Those are changed to B9 uh, to make the correct reference. And also on page 48, there were um, the uh, parts per million radius of exposures uh, used to be different. They, uh, that again was changed in the most recent Chapter 10 rulemaking, and um, that is just being uh, consolidated. So. And then Susan, I noticed on page 44 that I think there was a reference before, but the scheduled monetary fines. So that table is going away, or again, I think that goes into the bigger discussion of fines to me. Yeah, yes, that's correct. Um, yeah, there, there are some uh, references in 10-7-9 to monetary fines, and, and uh, we can address that further. In 10-3-17, uh, there um, is also a reference on page 52 to the elimination of the Form 1036A, and uh, that uh, goes back to the discussion about the citations. And the next uh, amendment is uh, to 10-3-28, horizontal drilling on the bottom of page 57. And Bob, can you address that? This rule was brought up last year, and it's a, it's a retry, I guess. Uh, the operators that uh, operate the same that are drilling the same unit. They did not want to have the exception to the 600-foot rule because they're the same operator. And that's basically what this is doing. Um, my only question on that is I looked at the rule again today for location exceptions because Jim and I actually talked about it. And on location exceptions, if you're moving closer to your own well, you have to notify your own working interest owners in your well. So I understand that a company may come in and want to be drilling six laterals and maybe all the working interest owners are the same and maybe they're not, but it just seems like even if we got some kind of affidavit or something, I think there's a kind of a duty, I don't know if it's a fiduciary duty of the operator to its working interest owners, especially those that are pooled, I'm questionable about that part, I'm not sure, but maybe if there was some kind of an affidavit that they could submit that says, you know, we let the offset operators know or whatever. So you text or email or whatever, but basically you would be doing that under 
under oath that you've done that, and then that might be a more of a simple process. So I'm, I'm supportive of what they're asking to do, but I'm just concerned that all the working interest owners won't be the same in all these boreholes. So maybe an affidavit that accompanies the intent to drill that says that they notified all the working interest? Or yeah, and the burden is on them. If they didn't do what they said, then, you know, that's going to be a problem. But it seems like there needs to be some thoughtfulness because I think I'm not sure that all the working interest owners in every well because you might participate in the first well and not in the remainder or people might drop out. So I don't know. I'm just saying I think there's a way to work it out. I just I don't know exactly what it is, but... I think it would eliminate a lot of paperwork here. I think it would streamline things. But if they issued, if they just did some kind of an affidavit, that might be sufficient, and that could be for all the wells. Okay. The next proposed changes are on page 66. And these are um, proposed uh, changes to 1055, uh, application for approval of enhanced recovery injection and disposal operations. Uh, yes, this change would um, make make it so if a operator has not filed a mechanical integrity test within six months or their completion report that the uh, um, the, the uh, permit becomes null and void. Uh, we get a lot of wells that uh, they'll file their completion report, but not the 1002A. But this is to prevent these wells from falling off our radar, that we know that they're, they're there. And it also it, it ensures that the operator proceeds in a workmanlike manner in developing that well. There are a number of changes to 10-5-6, uh, testing and monitoring requirements for UIC wells, mm -hmm. and that uh, start those start on page 67 and go through mm -hmm. page 74. Uh, Charles, could you address those? Uh, yes. Um, we started out, this was an effort to... Uh, uh, reduce the number of mechanical integrity tests in the state of Oklahoma, relieve the burden on some of our field inspectors and on the operators. Uh, we had many discussions with EPA Region 6. They really had no objections to it. Um, but uh, as they say, the uh, path to uh, perdition is paved in good intentions. Um, anything that you read henceforth on this, it refers to uh, commercial disposal well or relieving a commercial disposal well of an annual MIT, that will remain. All commercial disposal wells will be performing a manual MIT. In addition, uh, their initial, uh, their annual MIT will be at uh, permitted pressure unless they set a Murphy switch, in which case they can altern do an alternative test at 500 pounds. Okay, so let's say we've got a 65-year-old disposal well. Mm -hmm. um, they're still going to have to do their manual MIT test every year. So unless they get some kind of a waiver to do a radioactive tracer, and the the only, the only concern I've had is that we are got this five-year space of time, and we treat all wells the same, whether they're a, a fairly new well or whether it's a well that's been disposing for a really long period of time and I just my question is is that what we should be doing I don't know what the cutoff should be I don't want to be discriminatory but it seems like the issues might be more likely with a well that is incredibly old compared to a newer one but maybe I'm wrong about that I'm not sure uh, well the older wells certainly they will have more problems and the subsequent tests on those wells uh, have lower pressure uh, if it's a commercial well, then, of course, it will be 500 pounds if they put in the Murphy switch. I just think that as we're, it looks like there's a lot of revampment in all of these rules, and I still think that, you know, we're moving a lot of parts, and if we're moving a lot of parts, you know, I'm just, I'm still concerned about some really old wells that we have, and if they should just be, well, we don't do anything for them for every five years. 
That's a question. I'm not saying there should be an answer today. I'm just letting you know that's on my mind. Would you be thinking about something the age of the... It would probably be based more on the age of the casing than the age sure. of the permit. Sure. I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying we should do it this year. I'm just saying a lot of the things that you all are moving, this mm -hmm. is a lot to take in. Yes. And I'm not one of these industry folks, and I'm sure that they're looking at all that. I've got all kinds of circles and questions, but I'm going to leave it alone because I'm just letting you know I have a lot of questions about all the things we're changing and why and understanding them and who came up with some of the footages and how did we just pick number, certain numbers and that just in general, that's a question I have. Okay. Okay. Um, if, if I could uh, make a comment as well as Grayson sure. Barnes again. Uh, this one's easy. I was told it should be on, not in, because oh, it's not feasible uh, if it is in it, actually. So this is uh, on page 68, subsection little b, big D, triple I. Um, no, excuse me. Yep, that's right. Um, I believe it says a mechanical packer retrievable bridge plug or seating nipple plug shall be placed in the injection string not more than 75 feet above the top of the injection interval. Mm -hmm. uh, it was told to me that if it were in it, it couldn't inject, so it needs to be on. I think that might have just been typographical, well, or, or maybe I'm incorrect, but that's just kind of what was really there are to There me. are cases where operators will have some rather expensive string of tubing, five and a half inch lined, and they would like to take it and put it on another well, and we allow them to set a retrievable, retrievable bridge plug at their packer setting depth and test that casing. Uh, and they won't be injecting, but we require they test at whatever interval they're required to test, and then they can use that tubing somewhere else. Okay, again, this is from a non-engineer. I think what I was told is that if it's in it, it can inject. It has to be on top of it to inject in. I think that is what they were getting at, and, and maybe that's not the case. I think it was just maybe it says uh, in as opposed to on, um, but again, I'm not real sure how that works. So maybe it wasn't as easy of a suggestion as I thought. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. We, we may okay, I, I'm that. glad that was conveyed. I'm not sure I understand it. And the next one is actually going to be much more uh, convoluted probably than that, uh, dealing with the uh, pressure testing that, that was discussed. And it kind of starts on 68 and goes on into 69. Um, mm -hmm. And so if we're looking at a uh, disposal well that has volumes uh, greater than or equal to 20,000 barrels per day, um, then the uh, pressure for the test would be the 500 PSI G, which would be if they had that Murphy switch. Is that a correct understanding? Uh, yes. Okay, and so where the concern arose is if we go on into um, dealing with a well that has uh, a permitted volume less than 20,000 barrels per day, that testing pressure is 1,000 PSI G, uh, for the initial test, for non-commercial, uh, the initial test will be 1,000 PSI, unless they apply for alternative testing and they can make their initial test at 500. Any subsequent test uh, after that initial test will be at 300 pounds. Okay. Uh, so a well that is permitted for less volume would have a higher pressure threshold on the test. Uh, unless they set a, uh, a Murphy switch on it. Okay. And on the other, you would have to have a Murphy switch? Yes. Is it? Okay. And, and our purpose has been we, we like the Murphy switch. We mm -hmm. like the idea. It's a, continuing, it's a continuous monitoring. Uh, we allow Murphy switches to be set on uh, uh, wells that are in enhanced oil, enhanced oil recovery. They'll usually hook it up with a cell phone that'll call the station should they lose integrity, but it's a constant monitoring. If you have a disposal well, uh, basically this is something that will shut the pump off. Uh, and that seems like a good idea. I'm not sure if it's clear the way the rule's written that you could have a Murphy switch and it wouldn't be such a high pressure threshold. And the concern that was voiced to me is a well that's not permitted for as much volume is probably not suited to hold as much pressure. 
Um, and, and so it may be that there needs to be a little clarification that a Murphy switch would allow them to have a lower pressure threshold. Uh, and, and maybe that's in the rules and I just didn't see it there as uh, Commissioner Murphy pointed out quite a few yes, changes to wrap our heads around in this uh, grouping. Uh, and then the, the follow up kind of um, area of interest is along the same lines on page 71. Um, C big one, big A. Let's see where that is. And I think again here uh, the concern was it, it appears that um, a well that is permitted for 20,000 or greater barrels per day has this uh, 500 PSIG testing threshold, whereas if it were um, less than 20,000 per day, I believe that you end up with the lesser of 500 PSIG or the max permitted pressure. Uh, so it seems to me, and maybe this is a Murphy switch issue as well, uh, that um, potentially you're having to test at a higher than 500 PSIG uh, on your lower volume wells compared to the bigger volume wells. And it was voiced to me that generally wells that hold less volume per day can take less pressure. And so this was really just a concern of the integrity of the well uh, having to put so much pressure on it during the test that it could cause some issues. Okay. Okay. Um, again, the for non-commercial uh, initial test pressure uh, is the permitted pressure or 1,000 pounds or less. Any subsequent pressure after that will be 300 pounds. Um, we're requiring that anything uh, over 20,000 barrels a day shall be equipped with a continuous pressure monitor on the casing tubing annulus that will shut the well in should the pressure on that backside annulus increase uh, to 250 PSIG. And or, and or automatically notify the operator of mechanical failure. Um, I don't think I've answered your question. No, and it's a little above my head as far as the schematics on the wells concerned. Uh, but the way I read it, on the 20,000 or greater, once every five years, the testing pressure is five, 500. I, I believe you're right, yes. Okay, and so then if we go to a well it's less than 20,000 barrels per day, you would end up with either... You would wind up with 300 pounds pressure. Or whatever it was permitted for, whichever is greater. Well, the difference is the initial test, mm -hmm. which is the first test that they, they run on the well, and then subsequent test. The first test, the initial test, will be at permitted pressure or 1,000 pounds, whichever is less. Subsequent tests will all be at 300 pounds. Or whatever it was permitted for, which could be greater than 300 no, pounds? No, no, okay. just Subsequent tests will just be 300 pounds. Okay. And so maybe there just needs to be a little clarification on the B1. It uh, tested at the maximum pressure or, um, what, was it, what, what is it here, maximum pressure under the order or permit authorizing the well for injection, but not less than, th I, I gotcha, so it's either, it could be greater than 300 though, I guess. Uh, not on non-commercial and not for subsequent. Okay. We, we would only require 300 pounds on that. Because it wouldn't have a high enough if it were non-commercial, it would be higher than 300 anyways. Yeah, if it's not non-commercial, they have to test at permitted pressure every year annually, unless they set the Murphy switch for alternative testing, mm -hmm. and then they will test at 500 pounds. Okay. Fortunately, the engineers listening in said so there will be some follow-ups that we can, we can <laughs> <Okay>. discuss. <laughs> Thank I, you. I just have a bigger picture question. For pages 78 through 73, what are what are you trying to accomplish, Charles? I mean, there's a lot of strikeout. I can't tell if it's reworded, mm -hmm. done differently. How do we come up with the pressures? What's it based on for the footages? I'm just like, what's the big picture for a whole lot of changes for these five pages? What What's the big picture? Well, the big picture is uh, condense uh, and uh, clarify. Uh, originally, it was for the to reduce the number of uh, mechanical integrity tests that are run. 
Uh, we also, part of this is to recognize the fact that we have some large wells that perhaps require a bit more scrutiny and the 20,000 barrel per day plus uh, having to set the Murphy switch I think is, is one of the ways that we handle that. Uh, but if there's anything in particular, I mean this, that, that's our general overall goal. I mean, I'm, it's a lot of changes to clear things up, if that was the goal. So I, I just, you know, to me, if there's the foundation for how you came up with the pressures and and those things, that's really all I'm I'm interested in. Just it's hard to well, go in and see what all was have been changed with new language and just I, I couldn't I couldn't understand the big picture of what all the changes were really designed to do. Well, the pressure uh, part of this is that uh, a subsequent test on a well uh, can be 200 pounds. Most of the field inspectors will always test at 300 because if an initial test on anything less than 300 uh, pounds is 300 pounds. They're testing at 300. If a well will pass at 200 but not pass at 300, then it's on life support anyway. Uh, we wanted to clarify that, make that across the board. Um, I think as long as industry understands, I mean, I just feel like if these are the rule proposals and I'm going to vote on them, I, I don't really understand it. Well, I'm, I'm certain that we're going to get a lot of feedback. Excellent. And okay. I'm looking forward to talking about well, it. Well, I mean, I appreciate your steps and what you're doing, so it's not a criticism of that. Mm -hmm. It's just we're, we're changing a lot of stuff and all at mm -hmm. one time, and I'm just, it's hard to, I, it's hard for me to want to vote for something when so many moving parts. I just want to make sure I'm understanding why we're doing it. And I have confidence in you all, but I need to make sure I at least understand the fundamentals, and I'm struggling mm -hmm. with that right now. Okay. Let me just go straight to questions. Any uh, any other comments? Okay. Uh, any other changes you want to address on those uh, on those pages, Charles? Uh, well, let's see. Um, I think we've just about the questions just about covered most of this. Uh, the only other thing is for. Um, Wells that have uh, perforations above the packer. Uh, we're requiring that uh, a uh, testing procedure for uh, uh, an injection well without the tubing casing analyst or a well with perforations above the packer, this is a special circumstance. They will need to run a uh, radioactive tracer survey on that well. Uh, also, uh, there was one part that was deleted that we're going to leave in, and that will be in uh, on the previous page in V. Uh, it will require pressure testing of the tubing string. So an operator is run a radioactive tracer uh, on the tubing, and that will test the tubing and the packer. And they will also be required to uh, drop a line in their tubing and pressure test the tubing. That ensures that the tubing is uh, has integrity, and the radioactive tracer will demonstrate the integrity of the packer, the perfs, and then making certain that there's no fluid coming up the backside of the production casing annulus. Okay. The uh, next changes are on page 77, 10-5-9, uh, duration of underground injection well orders or permits. Uh, Charles or Patricia, would you like to address those? Yeah. On, at the bottom of page 77, uh, the very bottom of it, E, if an operator fails to keep you know, we struck, complete, or convert, and basically just replace that with perform an initial mechanical integrity test within the first 18 months, then the permit or order would expire. It's pretty much what we've gone by anyway and how it's worked out anyway. We just changed the language on it. Um, my question on that, Patricia, would be, would that language need to go in the permit or order? Because in some places it says it's an order of the commission. So would that language need to be included in the permit or the order? I think that would be a good idea. Okay, you might want to add language for that. Okay, will do. Okay. 
And uh, there are some additional changes to 10-5-10 on uh, page 78 and uh, further changes on pages 79 and 80. Uh, Patricia or Charles, would you like to uh, address those? Yes, yeah, so we just decided to remove that. Uh, this would basically uh, mean that uh, a transfer of a non-commercial well, they would have to run a mechanical integrity test uh, within one year of the transfer. And for the commercial disposal well, they would have to run a mechanical integrity test within 30 days of the transfer. So it's not, so the you want to go back to the original one-year language, right? Yes, okay. yes. Thought we would leave that one alone. Okay. And the changes at the uh, bottom of page 79 and the, towards the top of uh, page 80, are those intended to make the situation when a uh, an operator is unavailable for signature, the uh, incorporate the same language as for transfers of oil and gas wells that's in 10-1-15, uh, like in in indicate in situations where there's a bankruptcy or or other uh, proceeding. Uh, is uh, that correct? Correct. We'd we'd like a responsible party to uh, take over operations. And at the same time, make certain that it's it's someone that has has rights to that property. Okay. I, I think we need to think about that language because I know we had a case on appeal to the Supreme Court that's over an issue about transfer. So the situation where it says unavailable for signature, does unavailable mean they just they don't want to sign it? Or I I, I think this whole language I understand the intent of it, but. Um, the question would be, how far in the rabbit hole do we want to go with kind of being prescriptive as it takes all these things, or do we want to have some uh, discretion about some of the things that we would require? I don't know the answer to the question, but that unavailable for signature kind of concerns me. Somebody may just refuse to sign it, so I don't know if that's the same as unavailable. So I get what you're trying to do, and given that we have that case on appeal um, and we've had this issue come up, I think it's important. I just would be a little bit concerned about the wording. Okay. So, and Susan, I'd like to offer a couple of comments. Okay. I know. What can you say? Um, first of all, this uh, system of having the screen there is uh, and I'm going to call it streaming because I don't know all the technical terms and Sarah's helped and others have helped at the agency. Um, it's working great. There are people presumably all over the state who are able to hear the conversations and see the people very frequently and see what's on the screen. <coughs> So somebody said they normally call in. We probably won't use that term anymore. We can see audio visual, and uh, so we're moving forward. I only bring that up because we're in the early phases of a major effort in this agency uh, to spend that $5 million that you guys helped uh, uh, get designated for this agency to uh, improve our electronic systems and so forth. Some of it is already happening. Uh, we do have people in the governor's office and in the cabinet that are keeping an eye on us because they want to say, now, how's that money going? And I guess that's accountability, so that's fine. So a, wor a word of thanks for those people who've helped us uh, get this uh, started. And then uh, Susan, you and your colleagues have explained it. I know that a lot of these proposals are meant to try to facilitate going further with the uh, data systems that will account for things going forward. Uh, next topic, I want you all to know that today I provided the necessary vote to support Commissioner Murphy's uh, order on one of the biggest uh, financial um, uh, orders and uh, rate decisions, uh, and so I just wanted you to know we get along just fine lots of times. Having said that, I've been listening to some of the people in this room, and the comments of let's prioritize, there's an awful lot that's laid out right now. We've got 
a whole list of things. There's a lot of uh, new things. Um, I just want to tell the staff that I think you're up for it. And I think that uh, we have a lot of expertise that's working very hard and this meeting is good. We're getting a lot of input. So uh, I just want to speak for myself that I'm encouraging you to move full speed ahead and try and get as much of this done as possible in a short period of time. Uh, presumably for the legislative session that will come up early next year. Um, it's, a, it's a challenge. I had a piece of paper here that uh, all of us tend to be quoting the new governor occasionally, especially when it serves our purpose. Um, Anyway, the new governor is uh, quoted as saying, Oklahomans hired me to put a fresh set of eyes on everything in state government. Well, I think that there are those that want to uh, meet the challenge and move ahead. And I, I know that the, the staff and the leadership here is uh, working in that area and you have my encouragement and my support. Um, and. You know, what I'd like to see sometimes, we think these rulemakings are annual rituals. I'd like to do it every other year. Like if we really did a great job this year on Chapter 10, maybe we could uh, uh, not have to uh, bring it up for the next year. I don't know. I'll let you all think about that. Okay. That's uh, just a word. And I appreciate people using the microphones when they speak because that helps the system. Sarah, is there anything else we want to bring up or ask. We might say for those people who might be in, in Tulsa or some other place in the state, uh, if you're using the system today and it is uh, uh, working well, uh, let us know or give us whatever feedback is appropriate. Thank you. I did want to make two announcements. I nearly forgot. One, uh, uh, applications for disposal are now being posted online in our data file. As, as they come in, it's updated twice a week. So any operator in the state can review to see who is intending to put a disposal well and where. And then That was requested by several industry people through me, so I really appreciate you all doing that. Uh, yeah, we've got that going, and then additionally, I've just been told this, this afternoon that the seismic events from 2018, fiscal year 2019, uh, has uh, the events 3.0 and above have reduced by 68%. Yes, I wonder if it wouldn't be a good idea for us to take comment section by section as opposed to trying to discuss each item individually and, and that way we could just cover, make sure we're covering the items that people may have questions or comments about. Anyone agree, disagree? Yes. I, I think that's great because I think a lot of people haven't had a chance to digest all that. That's why I think we're not getting a lot of questions. I think we're going to get a lot of questions later. So getting the issues worked out ahead of time beats coming to a hearing in front of the commissioners and there's controversy because people got involved at the last minute. I've been through that and we've had a rulemaking in Chapter 10 every single year. I couldn't agree more if we do it a little more, a little differently, but if the law changes, we don't have a choice on whether we're going to have a rulemaking or not. So um, I just think the input that I've heard, I don't know that the commissioners have had anybody else call them or contact them or meet with them, but just a lot and people trying to digest what it is. So I think there's a lot of unknown, but I agree with Commissioner Hyatt. I think if you just went section by section, there's another meeting in October, and I think that gives people more time. Okay. The, um, I think the remaining uh, portions of the uh, subchapter 5, the UIC, are on uh, page 80. We've, I think, touched on those briefly. The revocation of 10512 application for administrative approval for the subsurface injection of on site reserve pit fluids, an application for permit for one time injection of reserve pit fluids. Um, um, I would just have to say that probably Kim Hatfield and I can have a conversation uh, about that. And, um, 
uh, emergency authority to inject an annulus. I, I, the only thing I could think of that would cause that would be perhaps a, a great deal of rain, which we've, we've seen in the past, uh, rather than have deleterious substance go over, flow over the pit and then down the creek, it might be better for it to be injected uh, in the annulus. Okay. But I, I would like to have more discussion with uh, with Kim. Okay. We're going to be talking anyway, so let's. Yes. Um, the next uh, changes are to subchapter 7, which deals with pollution abatement. And um, just uh, quickly, 10-7-2 uh, uh, provides or notes that the manager of the underground injection control department and or the manager of pollution abatement may have responsibility for certain uh, rules um, and uh, certain procedures. And on page 24, there's been a request uh, on prohibition pollution, 1075, that there be a report of uh, non-permitted discharges uh, by email or by text message. And I'm, uh, it's my understanding that the uh, field has requested that change. Susan, just a question. It says report verbally, and then it says by email or text message. So I don't think verbally is email or text message. So are they saying... Does a phone call work? I mean, that language doesn't match. Uh, I believe it's uh, it says uh, report verbally, uh, comma by email or by text message. So, and I might have Jim uh, address that. So all, I, all I'm saying is I don't think verbally is text message or email. I think it's a phone call would be verbally, or if you talk to him in person. I'm yes. I'm reading it. It's giving you three choices: either text message, email, or verbally. Mm -hmm. But I can see how it could be read either mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, Jim, would you like to address that? Well, the, the change for a lot of the, the reporting different different issues to the districts, to pollution abatement, whoever, the by phone, email, or text is the best way. Uh, you know, we could probably change the verbally to verbally or by phone. I mean, it, it's... So there be, I mean, verbally is a phone conversation, but to clarify it, we need to figure out how the language should be modified. But the best way for the inspector to be reached is by email or text, uh, given given the areas they worked in. If there's something going on, they need to be notified of. You know, email or text message is going to be better than than a phone call. Cell reception spotty. Text messages travel on a different frequency, and and they'll they'll carry better. So you'll get you'll get text message before you'd get a email and, and a phone call in a lot of cases. So they'd like to have the options in there. The options were not there before, so it was just verbally or in writing. And, you know, so getting that by mail doesn't really get us a good notice in a timely fashion. Okay. Ready? And um, Jim, you touched on this before, also in subchapter 7. Uh, making changes to 10-7-7 on page 85 and uh, to revoke the uh, the uh, ticket citations uh, in 10-7-9. Can you just briefly address that? Yes, as, as I stated before, the, the 10-36-A, the citation tickets are, are no longer used since we implemented the, the incident report system in the RBDMS system. And moving forward, the uh, inspectors can put multiple violations in, in one report rather than having to write a ticket on each one. Each ticket then has to be processed separately and uh, we're just removing all those references out of the rules. Okay. And uh, also in subchapter 7, uh, Sean, you had uh, changes to 10-7-16 dealing with uh, uh, changing flow back water pits to non-commercial pits. And can you just uh, briefly explain the rationale for that? Yes, on page 96 is where you'll find those rules. And as we discussed earlier, there's shown to be a need to change lar large flow back water pits in excess of 50,000 barrels from exclusively just flow back water to any water for temporary storage, disposal, or reuse. Uh, we feel that this would give uh, staff and operators a lack some clarity on the use of these pits and help facilitate recycling of water within the industry. Also, there's some language change within uh, 10716 Part F 
uh, we are going to uh, remove manager of field operations and replace that with pollution abatement department for a technical review of application notice construction operation and closure requirements. Sean, I might just suggest that you all do a search for flow back water because if you look on page 104 under surety requirements, it calls it a flow back water pit. So just might need to double check to do a, a search to make sure those are changed. Yes, I noticed that earlier when you uh, stated it. I'm definitely going to look through there. Thank you, Commissioner Murphy. Okay. And uh, Sean, also in subchapter 7, uh, there are uh, two uh, rules, 10-7-19 uh, on page 111, and a uh, similar change, I think it's 10-7-26 on page 121. Can you address those changes? Yes, uh, <clears throat> field staff have requested that a copy of the land application permit or otherwise known as the 1014S be posted at the well site, pad, or pipeline construction site during the land application process. Uh, this would help field staff with the data needed in case of uh, interruptions with their computers or laptops to get the data that they need to uh, assess the situation if it arises during the application process is occurring. And Sean, also in subchapter uh, 7, uh, changes on page 118, 10-7-20, non-commercial disposal or enhanced recovery well pits used for temporary storage of salt water, uh, pages 118 and 119. Can you address those? Correct. Uh, <clears throat> the staff would like for all future receiving pits at EOR facilities or non-commercial disposal well site facilities to... Uh, have a leachate detection system, much like what's in 1093 for commercial disposal well surface facilities. The leachate detection system for these pits will be beneficial to staff as they will be able to detect, detect pit integrity in a more timely fashion. Grayson Barnes, again, just a simple comment on that. Uh, maybe a definition of a leachate detection system would be useful. I had to call an engineer to ask what one is. Leak detection, it turns out. Mm -hmm. But uh, that might provide some clearance, uh, some clarity as to really what you mean by that. Thanks. Thank you. And I believe the last uh, changes in subchapter 7 are use of truck wash pits 10-7-33. Uh, on pages uh, starting on 131, and Sean, uh, those changes are merely changing the um, oversight of that uh, rule and the permitting, et cetera, from the manager of field operations to the manager of pollution abatement. Yeah, correct. This proposal is fairly simple and straightforward in that we'd like to change and replace manager of field operations with pollution abatement department for the permitting, surety, construction, operation, maintenance, and closure requirements for truck washout pits. And we're moving now to uh, subchapter 9, the commercial uh, disposal facilities, and the more substantive uh, changes are to 10-9-3 on page 156 and uh, about the installation of the leachate and collection systems, et cetera. Uh, is your discussion of that uh, similar to what you previously noted? It's uh, similar, but not exactly the same as leachate detection systems for commercial disposal well uh, facilities are currently uh, required. Uh, these would just, the leachate detection placement and uh, design of such would have to be approved by the Pollution Abatement Department. Okay. And uh, turning now to 10-9-4, commercial recycling facilities, the uh, present rule um, is stricken through, and the uh, proposed uh, new language begins on page uh, 169 and goes through page, I'm sorry, yes, uh, well, actually, the, the, new, um, the new language begins on page 169 after the uh, current rule is stricken through, and they go through page 183. Sean, can you address those? 
Yes, it is. starts on page 159, commercial recycling facilities. This looks like a large, broad sweeping changes to commercial recycling rules, but commercial recycling rules were transitioned from subchapter 8 several years ago. And in that move, drilling waste recycling or solids recycling was dropped. Uh, what we are proposing is a change to 165.1094 that encompasses all recycling of deleterious substances on a commercial basis, such as produced water, solids produced during drilling ops, contaminated soils caused by spills, and flow back from completion activities. Uh, this proposal looks complicated, but it's fairly simple in that it does not distinguish between different phases of recyclable material that I mentioned earlier, but breaks down recycling down into two, into two parts, stationary and temporary facility. These facilities will still have an order, but the particulars of each recycling process, site limitations, and overall environmental protection will be contained in a permit application that will have to be approved by staff or go through the hearing process to be approved. Having these proposed rules, these proposed new rules will grant operators added flexibility for beneficial reuse outside of what's currently delineated in the rules for both solids and future liquids. I've got just a couple of general questions. Is there a cost distinction between whether you file for a stationary or a temporary recycling operation? Do, are we making a distinction of that in the rules? No. Do you think that we should consider that? A fee associated with such? Well, I mean, I'm assuming normally you have to pay for a stationary commercial recycling facility, right? Don't you have to mm -hmm. pay for a permit? Correct. So are we going to treat a stationary the same as a temporary, so it would be the same amount, or should we consider that different? Currently, under the fees, we are not assessing a fee for the temporary or the movable recycling orders. Okay, I'm just asking questions and the definitions that you've got on page 170, where did those come from? I had several meetings with uh, stakeholders and council of stakeholders and we agreed upon several definitions. Okay, and then on the temporary commercial recycling, who who checks on if there's surface owner permission for the recycling operation? Is that something that they advise us of? And I'm looking under the definition of temporary where it says as long as the recycling operator has surface owner permission. Who, who's responsible for that? Who, who checks on that? Do we do that or they tell us that or how does that work? I believe before they set up temporary ops on a location or a anywhere within the state, they have to have a 1014 CR for each temporary site. Within that 1014 CR, there would be a landowner permission associated with such. Okay. And then down in the permit application, it says who may apply. And it says a person having a written firm option to purchase the land at the time of the permit application. So what if they took a 40 or 50 year lease um, I have a question about that, or where did the written firm option language come from? It came from existing rules. Okay. Might want to think about that a okay. little bit. And then down in the permit application approval in B, where it says after a view of the permit, I think it needs to say or order, because you said sometimes it's a permit or an order, so that would be uh, down in B about including the um, the that it might be an order of the commission. Correct. Um, on the surety requirements, uh, it's a little bit unclear to me when I looked at them that it looks like in some places the pollution abatement department does the surety and some places it says the commission. So I think probably want to spend a little bit more time on how that works because I just I can't point out the exact language but I just know I had a question um, about that and when it says an operator of a facility I don't know if it's all just commercial recycling facility because it's under that subsection or if that needs to be stated um, I don't know who the manager of document handling is is that still a title I don't think it is. Okay, so we might want to think about that language 
Would you so, want me to change the language on the rest of subchapter 9 for document handling? Um, I just think we don't want to put a, a title in there that we're no longer using. So I, I think I get generally, Sean, what you're trying to do. I just feel like there's a lot in here when I see a lot of little unintentional things that I think we need to look a little closer at the language. So I understand what you're doing, but we wouldn't want to vote on things where it says here that one place and over here it says this, and then we're voting on some, and we got a rule that is a proposition that doesn't even exist anymore. So I think I can tell some of it looks like a combination of old language with some new language in it. So I just think we probably need a little more looking at it. I don't, I don't have a, that was just what I noticed in going through it. I see a lot of kind of things like that. But the general gist of what you're trying to do, I get that. Okay. I promise I'm not trying to talk more than you, Commissioner Murphy. I, have I think you've got a long ways to go <laughs> to beat that. I have two comments uh, regarding this section on uh, C3C, which is on page 173, uh, regarding um, such facility to not be located within a 100-year floodplain. I would guess the activity in Tulsa this spring I uh, had this on the top of people's head. Um, is the intent such that an existing facility within a 100-year floodplain is to be no longer used, or is that grandfathered in? Uh, and if the intent is for it to be grandfathered in, I think it needs to maybe say constructed and such that one could continue to be used. Um, I'm not sure um, if that was considered. And so I was just kind of curious what the intent was uh, regarding that with existing facilities within a 100-year floodplain. Is the intent to shut them down? No. Okay, so one would continue to uh, be able to operate. At the intent of this day today, there's not an intent to shut a commercial recycling facility down that's in a commercial or in a 100-year floodplain. Uh, just on a go-forward basis, that would be an area that would be off limits. Correct. Okay. And then the other question, um, or kind of more of just a comment, not a question, on uh, page 178, which is C12, I believe, um, it's uh, the record keeping requirement uh, regarding the source of the water. Um, and my understanding is on, on many of these recycling systems, and they're becoming more and more obviously in an effort to uh, reduce disposal and reduce seismicity. Uh, many of these systems, it's my understanding, uh, are kind of like a spider web and all meet up to a, a kind of a master line that then goes to the recycling facility. Um, and the feasibility on an existing infrastructure to start putting uh, meters out in the middle of areas that that hadn't been considered uh, previously could be pretty costly prohibitive um, if there's no electric around uh, getting a generator out there getting the right to have it set up on the surface and so similarly to the hundred year floodplain maybe this would be on a go forward type basis um, and had that been a rule when these systems were put in place, they may have been uh, oriented differently. And so um, was curious there if, if, if this intent is uh, such that current systems need to go in and put additional uh, metering on those or if they would, um, like in the floodplain situation, be grandfathered in. There currently isn't a spider web commercial recycling facility in the state that is hardlined into wells that takes in in the exact story that you're asking. So they would all be brand new. Okay. Um, that might just be something we need to talk about. Um, as my understanding, some do exist, and um, the feasibility of getting monitors on those. Because uh, they're, meter they're metering them coming out of the, the well, and into the facility, and if they're coming from different wells and meet up into a, a master line, that is not occurring as? Not on a commercial basis. It's all non-commercial, which okay. would and not so, fall under these rules. And so if you were to convert uh, an existing one that's a spider web to a commercial, then that would require putting in additional meters. We would have to look at it at that time. Okay. And so the meters then are, are more intended to be um, – not a, a hard requirement, but the spirit of this is more dressed to solids when it comes to the source of the deleterious substance. So you know which well 
mm -hmm. and how much kind of thing. Correct. And so if one were to convert, then they would need to get the meters on. Quite possibly. Okay. Thanks. I think that's all I have. Um, Sean, I found the reference on the surety, and it's on page 181B where it says surety mountain type. It says the commission shall establish, and then on the other surety requirements, it says... I think the director of the pollution abatement department. So just need to get those reconciled. Thank you, Commissioner. The next uh, subchapter, subchapter 11, plugging and abandonment, and there are proposals on page 184. I'm sorry, 185 and 186. Um, about um, wells exempted from plugging and additional testing of wells. Uh, Jim, could you address those? On uh, Section G, the wells exempted from plugging, uh, we're just looking to strike out the shutting gas wells for the purpose of this section shall be considered producing wells in operation. And uh, I believe, Brad, was this one that you had asked about? Yes, it was. Yeah, can you, you give some background on that? Yeah, we have a... I, I tried to find the documentation for this, and I've looked, and I can't find it. From, from everybody that I've talked to, this well was put in when we had the first boom for the pipelines. We had wells out there with no pipelines going to them, so they added this rule so that these wells could sit out there and not fall under the one-year rule. Uh, that's been there a long time. I know this has been brought up numerous times over the years. Uh, staff doesn't feel like, me personally, I don't feel like that this is fair to the mineral owners or to the state of Oklahoma. We've got gas wells that are the only well in the section that's sat out there for 10 years or more and never produced. Uh, that's why we would like to strike this, uh, put it in the same category as the, the oil wells, and they would also fall under the, the statute 53 that, you know, if they're uh, held by the otherwise producing lease, then, you know, that's fine. It's just the standalone gas wells is what we would like to address. Okay, and we're clear there's no statutory provision just for the shut-in gas wells? That, that's, I, I, I have looked and looked to back this up. I, I cannot, I can't find it. Uh, it, it could fall under the, the Gas Act. I just, I can't find it. Uh, there could be something. Yeah, I, I think what you're requesting, it makes a lot of sense. I just, I don't know what, I don't know what the statute says. I don't know, I'm not, I'm unclear on that. And I just think we need to probably double check that. And uh, Jim, the uh, new subsection A, H, testing of wells exempted from plugging, can you address that? On page 185 and 186. Okay, we wanted wanted to add a section on uh, testing of wells that are exempted from plugging. And when we get an exemption from plugging filed, we need to make sure that there are no, no problems with the well. So uh, we've added these paragraphs in. You know, and if there is a cast iron bridge plug or packer in the well, must perform a pressure test. If there's no cast iron bridge plug or packer in the well, perform a fluid level test. We feel that if we're going to give an exemption from plugging, that we need to make sure that the integrity of the well is there on a on a on the regular basis, and that was not clearly in the in the rules before. And we want to add then that the operator must contact the division district office field inspector at least 48 hours prior to so we can witness the test. And then the written report with the result of the test to the district office within three days of the receipt of the, re the results. And the last rule in subchapter 11 on page 187, the temper exemption from plugging requirements, could you address those? Yes, the uh, with the changes in the fees, and it was missed in, in last year's rulemaking, but the, the form indicates 
one thing that uh, an address where the, the form needs to go and forms had been going to the district offices but all forms with fees now go through the central central office through finance downstairs through the central receiving point so we're making the changes for the address indicated on the form 1003A in the rules and then uh, the permit will be for a period of five years if it passes a pressure test if it's only doing a fluid level test it's going to have to be done every year not to exceed a total of five years and then, oh, go ahead. and then and then uh, 30 days prior to the expiration of the permit we've removed the or apply for a new permit because we put in the the five-year limit on the fluid level test exemption Those are the last um, proposed change to subchapter 11. Uh, subchapter 17, uh, Rule 10 17 7, well tests. There's a proposal on the, on the bottom of page 190. Duncan, uh, could you address that? Uh, yes, I can. What this does is uh, it just simply uh, reduces the administrative burden on the operators to have to post a pressure if it's a marginal well. A lot of these wells, which are they're vertical or you know they they're re-entered, that sort of situation is kind of a problem for a lot of operators to do that, and it just creates another exemption category uh, so that uh, it's not necessary to do that. It just expedites paperwork and less of a burden on them, less of a burden on us. Okay. And Duncan, the final uh, change is subchapter 17 on page 191. Uh, could you uh, revisit that? Okay, what that is is the same one which I uh, had at the beginning here. It was uh, the form 1007A, which would be uh, the annual unallocated gas well survey for uh, posting annual shut in pressures on that. And that was uh, the, the form uh, which I was mentioning earlier we were trying to revoke because it's basically zero interest on it. It seems to be an unused form, and um, very few uh, operators have even done that at all. OK. And uh, Bob, uh, the changes to Appendix A on pages uh, 192, 193, and 194. Yes, the statute does not address 160-acre oil allowables anymore, so we'll just go ahead and take that out. Okay. And uh, finally, the, um, the Schedule A fines and the Schedule B fines on appendices E and F, and Jim, that uh, pertains to the elimination of the uh, ticket citation system. Yes, a lot of the, the the Schedule A fines were listed on the tickets. The Schedule B were not, and since there's very few of the rules that actually had a fine associated with them, we were removing the fines from all the the references and looking at uh, you know, open to looking at a schedule of categories. And if anybody wants to join the party, let me know. Okay. Um, I think that's all that um, staff has. Uh, commissioners, do you have anything else? Okay. Has, has any of the industry um, submitted any suggestions or changes in addition to these? Have we received anything? Um, yes, I, I think some, um, and I know that uh, some of the changes that industry that has suggested having been incorporated in the proposed rules, and I think that the UIC department has received additional ones, and they're in their process of reviewing those. Okay, so I think we just need to generally understand, on top of this, there may be many others. So I just think, again, I mean, I appreciate what Commissioner Anthony said, but this is an area that I have kind of some experience and knowledge in, so I feel like I'm trying to be helpful. So when we put new language in, I think we put a lot of language in that this doesn't match that and we don't have this title anymore. So I think the intent was really good. I just think we need to spend more time on the language itself. And so I know this is just a, a beginning start, but if the industry is going to have more suggestions on top of this, this is even going to get bigger than it already is. That, so that's my, I appreciate everyone's efforts, um, and I just wanted to say that because I don't see a lot of this 
relating to technological changes at the commission. I see them as changes with regard to changes in the industry or other things that we're having to deal with, which I really appreciate the staff is looking at that. So I remember when I came, it had been 20 years before there had been any changes to the horizontal um, drilling rule. So I really appreciate the fact that you all are looking at it. So I might have questions or suggestions about language, but it's certainly, I don't mean that to detract from all your efforts to do what you're doing. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. If there are no other comments, I think uh, the meeting has concluded. Thank you.